STEM at Home, STEM Talks, is a podcast devoted to issues related to the ongoing pandemic and how it is impacting learning. The STEM learning ecosystems will bring you lively and informative conversations with thought leaders, parents, students, and others, all thinking about the pandemic and the need for STEM learning. The first podcast in this series features SLE COP Director Alyssa Briggs interviewing Jeff Weld. Jeff is the Executive Director for the Iowa Governor's STEM Advisory Council and the former Director of the Federal Government's Office of Science Technology Policy. In this podcast, Jeff talks about the pandemic, what it means for STEM learning, and what action ecosystem leaders should be taking today. Hi, this is Alyssa Lenhoff Briggs, uh, Director of the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice. And this afternoon, uh, Jeff Weld has taken some time out of his schedule, um, his remote schedule these days, uh, to join us uh, to talk and to offer some thoughts for families, educators, school leaders, and others who are trying to keep learning and STEM learning going in these crazy times. So, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Lisa. Great. So I think that, you know, what I'd like to ask you first um, is a pretty big question. And that question is, um, Jeff, what, what can families, teachers, school leaders, and others do at this crazy time to keep STEM learning going? Yeah, I love the question and I love the idea. I think you and I, STEM Ecosystems and Iowa STEM both have the same instinct to be relevant and helpful during this uh, dark cloud of a pandemic sweeping the country, sweeping the world, sweeping the world. And so kudos to you all for the resources that you're posting and including this conversation. Uh, I think somewhere over the weekend, I was watching a newscast and somebody mentioned that uh, Shakespeare had written King Lear during a, a quarantine as a result of the Black Plague. And I thought, well, now if that great writer can write that epic piece in a period of downtime, we can all do something. We may not <laughs> write a, a prize-winning uh, piece of literature, but we can sure enough make the world a better place while we weather this. And so that was my inspiration to come back to the office and intend to make lemonade from this lemon we've all been dealt. As you are, the Iowa STEM team is committed to ramping up services in specific ways to support kids and parents and teachers and communities uh, as best we can. And interestingly, the timing I wouldn't have invited this disaster, but this disaster is uh, instantly advancing one of the objectives of the federal STEM education strategic plan that came out in late 2018. And you might know, I have it committed to memory, of course, that on page 26 of that federal plan is an objective that uh, we, as in the American STEM education community, Expand, now I'm quoting, expand digital platforms for teaching and learning. Now, the authors of that plan imagined that these objectives would be decades, at least a decade, if not decades, in the realization. But this COVID-19 uh, calamity has a silver lining in that awkward and tough as it is to be this agile, massive rollouts of digital learning and teaching platforms are taking place. Is the pedagogy perfect? No. Are the resources always perfect? No. But one very certain outcome of uh, this, this uh, Shakespearean plague moment is that there's going to be a lot more uh, adaptability to online learning. Uh, for all the reasons that are in that STEM plan. It, ultimately, it can be an equity, um, inclusion, and diversity equalizer to offer, at some point, high-quality, consistently high-quality instruction and learning platforms for kids, parents, teachers, caregivers, communities, adults transitioning from job to career, whatever. So uh, something good, at least in that regard, is going to come out of this. I think there's something else that uh, I hope comes true, and I'm kind of uh, reflecting on history on this one. So we all probably remember the uh, 
another calamity, several calamities in our history that kind of uh, echo what we're going through now. Certainly 9-11, 2000, was an instance of upheaval in American society. But what came of that, of course, was a, a strong um, upswell of support and endearment for first responders, firefighters, police officers, and that uh, persists to today wonderfully. But uh, it also resulted in a bump in volunteerism into the military. So today's military was definitely strengthened by a negative societal experience. I personally can go back further than that to 1973. I was a kid in in Iowa City, Iowa, and uh, had a dirt bike at the time. And I remember gas prices were going through the roof. I could hardly afford to fill my gas tank with my newspaper money during a 1973 OPEC nation's oil embargo on the United States. And difficult and as disruptive as that was to American society, something really good came from it. And a, a uh, sweeping reform to auto efficiency regulations uh, so that miles per gallon skyrocketed in American automobiles and, and international automobiles for that matter after OPEC, as did America's sourcing of petroleum, including home tapped petroleum. So things, you know, that uh, cast a pall across America always uh, come out to improve some function or other about how we behave. I think even in the case of AIDS and Spanish flu, um, the research platforms, my goodness, Spanish flu launched an entire microbial research agenda for the United States and, and AIDS and autoimmune deficiencies and medicine development and research and development in general. So with a little luck, fingers crossed here, when we come out the other side of COVID-19 and if we succeed in delivering the appropriate resources and support systems to learners and their parents and their educators and caregivers, we could inspire a decade-long bump, I guesstimate, somewhere between 2025 by the time these kids graduate high school and then go a decade out to 2035. We could see a nice bump of a decade where a bunch of young Americans will have this indelibly emblazoned on their neurons, this COVID experience and what it did to them and meant to them at their homes through a period of time such that they're determined to uh, study um, biomedical fields, bioengineering fields, health and safety fields. So maybe we're in for a nice uh, post-secondary enrollment bump in the two-year and four-year institutions of America over the course of 10 years for all these kids who want to do something to contribute and see to the um, amelioration of this thing or the fact that the next time it happens, it's probably not an if, it's a when, they're in the driver's seat and they respond appropriately. So there's some there's a lot of positives that come out of this, and um, it's going to depend on you and me and so many people delivering the services that are needed right now. Wow. Jeff, I love, love, love your optimism um, and really appreciate it. And, you know, I think it's times like this, you know, when we need to remember history and, and look way back. So let me ask you, Jeff, how do we get our modern-day King Lears to the stage? How are we going to give families and ecosystem leaders and government leaders um, and educators the tools that they need to um, seize this moment? Yeah, that's a million-dollar question, Lisa, likely a billion-dollar question, and hopefully some <laughs> of the uh, uh, the government uh, funding to support systems in this period will include robust investments in virtual, digital, and distance education. Although I, I've picked up a pet peeve in the verbiage being used, you probably have, and so many people have, and that's this whole idea of social distancing. I had a, my son in Texas, a young professional in Austin, told me he's not filling his social quota lately, and I, was, I chuckled over the term. I hadn't heard social quota. In fact, he's kind of an introvert. He goes, no, I don't, you know, it's a remote desktoping, as so many of us are lately, and he goes, I'm not, get, I'm not reaching my social quota. And uh, 
we had a conversation about how misplaced the term is. Social distancing should be merely physical distancing, but the social connection ought to be maintained. This was a conversation I had with him and so many people are having, you and I are having now, is um, it, it's definitely a physical distance, but there's a high priority, an imperative on social connection. So I'm hoping the news media will transition from the former to the latter and uh, people are beginning to really drive the social connection imperative through this period. So that's one thing that I think is we think about how do we engage uh, the Shakespeare's and the community leaders and the corporate heads and uh, local political leaders and so on in this challenge is social connection, social engagement, not social distancing, but certainly physical distancing. I, I think, think you know, there's so many re- Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say I think it's a really important distinction. Thank you for calling it out, Jeff. Yeah, certainly not the only one, but uh, the kid really drove home the point to me that uh, we've all got to stay even more strongly connected. But to your point about um, who can do what, it's inspiring to see daily. My inbox lights up like a slot machine lately. Yours probably does too with all these organizations that are offering resources and, um, and and freebies and some who were not free until lately and they're showing some great generosity and commitment uh, to offer some of their services. Certainly you guys in STEM ecosystems, you're in the driver's seat, you're, you're a, a star player in this space of rapidly responding to the situation and putting up helpful resources and activities and lessons and, and so on. And then there's others in this game, STEMx, code.org. You might have noticed the other day, my, my former office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, has put forth a, a Tech for Learners webpage, an amalgam yes, of yes. Mm-hmm. all the tech companies and what they're offering. Engineering as Elementary is now up online. ST Math is offering some uh, free uh, programming, which is outstanding. We have uh, opened a web link at iostem.gov called Teachable Moment. We were all sitting around a table recently and said, oh, my goodness, if this is not a teachable moment, an opportunity will have been squandered. And that is, in this instance, the world of health and medicine and bioscience and microbiology, uh, biomedical engineering. There's so many epidemiology. There's so many uh, amazing fields on full display, STEM fields. And the new hero, you know, the, the fireman and the, police officer and the first responder of 9-11 is now the, the nurse and the EMT and the epidemiologist. And uh, how interesting to have a, a new cadre of heroes in a different branch of STEM. And so uh, being able to leverage that through this teachable moment is going to be paramount on all of our parts. So we created a web link off of iOS STEM called Teachable Moment. And uh, there we're aggregating your materials the STEM ecosystem advances, as well as some of these others um, that are coming out. It's annotated and it's vetted. We have an expert team here that's uh, looking through all the freebies that are coming forth and selecting what we consider to be staff picks, as if you're walking through a mm-hmm. Barnes & Noble, which you probably can't do right now, and you see the bookshelf that says uh, staff picks, and you can trust those. So we're trying to do the same thing as you guys like to, is vetting what's out there. It's a, it's a cacophony. It's a lot of noise and it's probably oh getting my. noisier. Yes, the premium absolutely. is on the, what can people trust, right? Oh, yeah. And so let me ask you a follow-up on that. You know, um, I'm certain that many people will go to Teachable Moments and to the STEM writing ecosystems. But, you know, for those who don't and who don't have a trusted vetted source of information, how do, how do teachers and how do parents and families know what is a credible resource? Are there any telltale signs? <laughs> that's going to be a, that's going to be a premium, as a, not only noise educationally, but noise in terms of uh, solutions and magic tools. I mean, the noise that's coming at the public through social media, in this instance, as always, but particularly perhaps now, really requires a filter, a judgment, a gauge on what we're looking at, a sensibility. But there brand matters and your brand is so strong you've earned it it's a trustworthy authoritative source authoritative source i feel like iowa stem locally has earned a similar 
brand within our state borders, as have so many states, Idaho and Pennsylvania and Texas and so on, so many state STEM initiatives, so many STEM ecosystems in Omaha and Kansas City and Tulsa and so on. And uh, that brand is really going to be called to be a premium now. And I think my team sat around the table and we also acknowledged that merely throwing things up onto a web page is not the answer. We've got to vet and uh, test and uh, use our professional lens to be able to assure our our constituents that what you're going to see on Teachable Moments is can be trusted, that pros have looked at it. We're going to have a really interesting um, hazard, though, Alyssa, that I know haven't escaped anybody, and that's access to the underserved. This, this whole right. moment is going to exacerbate an already existent have and have not. Um, aside from the question of quality of what's being downloaded and, and the pedagogy to deliver online experiences, there's just, again, that cacophony of offerings, and, and they're, all, they're all online and they're all virtual. And what about the kids and families who don't have access to the Internet in rural Iowa? Uh, broadband access in rural communities can be uh, severely inhibited, as can urban opportunities to find uh, computers with good Internet access. So I think it, it's uh, imperative on all of us. First thing, yeah, let's get some resources up that people can trust and right on its heels, if not simultaneously, give deep uh, and earnest thought to how we make sure that all learners have access so we don't come out the backside of COVID only having made the chasm worse by our right. – um, response to the digital online world. It'll, it'll fulfill a, a wonderful objective of the STEM plan, but the STEM plan was very clear that every step of expanding digital platforms has to take into account um, diversity and, and opportunity to access. So somewhere in there, I think you asked about specifically uh, community leaders and um, schools, and, you know, I'm thinking about Everybody's got to step up to this, schools and churches and YMCAs and Boys and Girls Clubs, and nonprofits, the scouts, um, because this is really going to take the entire village. I was intrigued by a visit I had over the weekend with a local high school teacher, and uh, his name is Rich. And I said, Rich, what are you guys uh, doing next week? Uh, spring break is over as of today, and they're back at work in some fashion, although the school is closed and the kids have dispersed through the community. And he said they have all been directed to reach out one by one by phone or email or text or whatever mode might reach those kids and those kids' caregivers, reach out to every kid on their homeroom list and establish that, A, they're eating, or do they need food support? B, technology assistance to access online learning, and, and then C, associated other factors of not being in school and what services and support might be needed. And I found that so encouraging and a ideal use of this teacher's time. And through doing that outreach, hopefully it's not just this fellow Rich and his community, but it's hopefully happening across the nation. People are both checking on the kids at home and documenting, right. cataloging who doesn't have access and, and then making those critical connections. This is where the community kicks in. And maybe when I say community, it can be STEM ecosystems, it can be Iowa STEM. This serves as a clearinghouse or a conduit for those in need and those with resources so that if if the school had a bank of laptops, can we arrange a checkout system? Or similarly, the local church or YMCA or Girls and Boys Club or what have you, how do we get the technology and the Wi-Fi access to the kids who need it is a simultaneous hazard and challenge right alongside the fact that we're posting what we think are the latest and greatest digital learning opportunities. That's a comma, not a period following the comma, and how do we see that every kid has access to these things? Right, right, absolutely. So um, later today, uh, the Summer Ecosystems is launching a discussion 
about the issues of technology and connectivity and how the this pandemic is only further distancing those who are already you know in trouble in terms of connectivity and technology with the hope of doing exactly what you have just said trying to mobilize you know the village but let me ask you jeff what should this village be asking of of this local government of state government of federal government to help with this issue of connectivity and technology well the ask would be of communities the community ask of all of us in leadership is what services can you provide me and, and my my local my proximate community to get us through this so for example everybody won't be able to do the same thing, right? If there's a technology company with a bank of laptops, that's a solution that can be offered. If it's a McDonald's or a Comfort Inn in your town that have a, a Wi-Fi in the vicinity of the building, it's an invitation to come sit in our parking lot and uh, do your homework in, our, in your car and uh, tap into our Wi-Fi. We're going to lift the password restriction and anybody who comes by can access it. So it becomes a matter of who has which service it can be offered. If you're a service provider, um, offer your service free online. If you're a, if you're a compelling figure in the world of uh, construction or healthcare, and if you've got the time, post a podcast about how uh, your training and experience and interest in uh, bugs and germs as a kid has now translated into a critical profession that the world is counting on, for which you have uh, a deep sense of uh, meaning and uh, value. So it kind of depends on, on people's capacities, but it's a very generalized to ask of communities in my mind at this time, which is everybody can do something. I heard our governor the other day ask uh, schools to open their doors to um, standing up temporary daycare systems for um, professionals uh, essential to keeping healthcare systems moving and so on, or universities and cruise ships opening themselves to be temporary hospital beds. It's just kind of like you could just kind of do a canvas or a survey of professionals in your community, and there's nobody I can think of who can't say I can do something. I can do X to help resolve this, like cafeterias and restaurants and the kids that are going hungry. Yeah, it's uh, it's almost beyond my imagination and yours to catalog all the service that could be provided, but that's the happy burden of the people we ask. Our responsibility is to frame the question. Great. Great. How about for federal government, Jeff? What should we be asking? How should we be doing it? What's our best path through here for the issues of technology and connectivity? Well, I'm so delighted with that Tech for Learners uh, compendium put together by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I don't have any idea what the big stimulus package is going to entail in terms of uh, how they see themselves spending that money, but certainly I've seen through the U.S. Department of Education some relaxation on on uh, coded policies with regard to standardized testing and uh, credit hours, and um, there's murmur and talk about tuition waivers and deadline waivers at least for um, student loan payments and so on. I, I feel as though the feds are doing similar to what you and I are doing. They're looking across agencies, USDA, NASA, NSF, ED, EPA. And when it comes to STEM education, I don't have a good, strong conduit anymore back to that community, but I have enormous respect for those folks and great faith that agency by agency, they're stepping up and curating content or generating content or looking at financial models that are tenable or services that penetrate to communities of greatest need. And um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that manifests. Right, right. Um, Jeff, do we need to be lobbying? Do we need to get a collective unified voice on the on this issue of um, technology and and connectivity? 
Yes, always, and more so than ever. But the digital learning platforms in particular, the lion's share of what's going to happen here is virtual virtual teaching and learning. And we've opened a Pandora's box, and this is not going away, nor should it. But it has a long ways to go to be perfected. You and I are both aware and have friends who are adopting, adapting to and adopting virtual instructional platforms, sometimes for the first time in their careers. Others are old hat at this, but it's a real hit and miss and uh, an uneven landscape. But it's likely to, um, it's not It's not going away. It's not going to be put back into a box. People are going to learn uh, virtual communications and instructional methods now in the heat of the moment. And once having done so, institutions as well as individuals aren't going to go back to a historic, time. So the real premium, the lobbying effort that we should all be putting forth, but I, I think some of us have uh, lobbied for through recent history, the last decade or so, but really needs to be amplified is quality of services, funding for the development of quality services. I mean, educational technology and virtual instruction and learning are exceedingly shallow research bases right now. The National Science Foundation, the Department of Education, two principal funders in this realm, could do an awful lot more, and that's actually called for in the federal STEM strategic plan is, is um, research resources to help us learn now quickly, hopefully, what works and what doesn't. And once we have determined uh, successful and unsuccessful practices, then we need to uh, pour resources rapidly and widely into professional development for all the folks that are in the driver's seat who are being counted on to deliver um, a, a new mode, a reinvented model for education, really, when you think that uh, teachers and professors were turned out within a week, a week and a half time, and told in this 10-day period, please do a 360-degree pivot and deliver your courses online, many of whom had never done so. So it's, uh, I don't think hyperbole to say that we're asking people to reinvent education as we know it in an unbelievably short period of time. So the fallout from this, the lobbying effort that needs to be amped up and amplified is we have got to support these people. We've got to support this system. It's uh, unforeseen and uh, unknown at this scale, system of education before this time. Get it right and get it right soon, and that calls for resources that develop quality curriculum, research that vets and validates curriculum quality, and uh, student learning that abides by uh, cognitive learning theory, and then the professional development that supports wide-scale implementation of it. Are you aware, you referenced earlier um, some of the uh, work that's going into the stimulus packages now, um, are you aware that any of this is going to um, be represented um, in any of the ongoing discussions. And I missed the, part, the first part of that question, Lisa. Start oh, that one with over. The, sti the, the coronavirus stimulus packages. How do we make sure oh. that this is front and center? Or have you heard that it is? Or where do you think we are with that? I have not heard. It's a grand mystery. I would guess, uh, even here in my state, kind of microcosmic of the federal condition, um, Funding conversations center around two or three major pillars, right? One is, of course, uh, supporting uh, displaced workers and seeing that they don't go hungry and they don't get evicted and, and they don't miss out on their own health care and education needs. That's probably first and foremost, um, although I don't think the verbiage around the state nor federal conversations about the fund uses penetrate to the level of what kind of education these people are getting, except in the realm of child care for um, professionals most uh, in need during this time. And then the other pillar, of course, is to support uh, uh, the private sector, businesses that uh, are on the verge of collapse as a result of this calamity, whether they be um, hotels, restaurants, airlines, what have you. Um, so the education conversation at large, I fear, is going to lag a little bit, but it, it should lag just a little bit. 
in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people are at the level of having enough to eat and a safe place to sleep. And once we resolve that, then I think we come next with this question of let's not let minds waste away through this period either. But So we've got to find our timing. And I don't think I've seen that sort of a dialogue yet. I would imagine that the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education is is probably having a very parallel conversation with the administration right now. As soon as people get fed, as soon as they're safe, can we come next and make sure that people's uh, intellectual needs and growth are being accounted for. So unless we've got a sense of uh, timing we have to be tuned into and and uh, not to intrude too quickly on those most basic needs, but to make sure that um, our concerns are on people's minds just as soon as the opportunity presents itself. And it's comforting to know, Jeff, that you're going to be there um, helping lead the charge on that. So um, I can't thank you enough for your time today and all of your leadership for uh, STEM over the years um, and continuing um, both in Iowa and your presence nationally is still very much felt and appreciated. So Jeff, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you to STEM Ecosystems. You guys are bright uh, spots across the American landscape, across the global landscape of STEM education. And this is going to be a real moment for you to uh, shine, making lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jeff, so much. Really appreciate it, and we'll talk soon. Okay, thanks, Alyssa. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. You've just heard STEM Talks. Watch your inboxes for our next podcast. And in the meantime, be safe and healthy, and remember that your work with STEM is changing lives and improving communities.